Thank you. Good morning. Um, so I'm here to talk about designing immersive experiences in escape room puzzles. Who here has played in an escape game or escape room? Show of hands. Good chunk. Good chunk. And so the rest of you are waiting for your moment. All right. So first, like, who, who am I? Why am I here? And it's an honor to be invited to FITC to share my knowledge, because there's a lot of good knowledge here. And so basically, I'm a game designer at Wero. I've made escape games. I made video games. I'm still doing all that. I teach game design at George Brown and at um, Ryerson. And it, I, it, about 10 years ago, I made a game called Tor Game with a group of wild individuals. And it took place throughout the city of Toronto. And that's actually a puzzle from that game. Today, they would say that this is an escape game in the streets. Back then, we called them alternate reality games. So a lot of this stuff has happened before. All of this will happen again. It's really interesting. But I played escape games, and I got angry. And because I'm so egotistical and maniacal, I guess, but I'm in front of a room of people talking about game design so often that I'm so used to being able to do that. And I played some escape games, and I was like, these are some bad design decisions going on here. This frustrates me. But no, I had no one to tell this to. So I wrote a book. And I figured that was the way to get the, all, this, all this design stuff I want out there, out there. So what's the point of me being here today? Well, basically, because of that book and because of all this stuff, I've, you know, escape games and all this fun game stuff, I want to talk about puzzles and flow. What we see in escape games is a, a lack of uh, knowledge coming from a previous game of design experiences, from video games, board games, alternate reality games, you name it. And a lot of that stuff still needs to be applied to escape games. So that's what I want to bring into the conversation today and how to think about this stuff. And there's a lot of different ways we could go about bringing in this knowledge. So key things. If, if you were to leave after this slide, I at least want you to know that the key things of knowledge here is you need to be consistent in your design throughout your entire experience. Consistency is key. If you lose consistency, you start to lose the player's attention and you start to lose the ability to give knowledge and tricks to the players. You don't want to just guess because we don't need to guess. We, can ha we have these good tools you can figure out that allow you to better surmise what is happening with your players inside of your room. And of course, all good design, empathy is a part of that. And escape games are no different. One quick note is I haven't designed an escape game where you actually have to physically escape from a room because I don't like the idea of actually locking people inside of a room because I know it causes a lot of stress for a lot of people needlessly. And I don't think that that's adding to a lot of the games I designed. I'd rather have people be engaged into breaking into something than breaking out. So today, what I want to get into is what's a puzzle? What do I mean by flow? What can we learn? from the world of video games, and what will make these, these puzzles better in escape games. So as we go through this, of course, think about the user experience, think about the player experience, and why I have those two things as separate, as I know a lot of people here are UX experts, but I just want to, again, highlight the fact that the user experience is sort of like bookends the play experience. So the user experience includes when you show up to the venue and there's some cool stuff going on, that's part of the user experience, but the play experience doesn't start until the game starts. So there's a difference there, but we need to be conscious of both because the UX will impact what the player perceives. Key thing about context, what, where is this game being played? What is the game about? When, what culture is this for? What's the age group? Think about all those elements. Here's my definition of a puzzle. It's a static and logical challenge which players solve with the assistance of clues. If you have this, you're well on your way to be making a good puzzle. What do I mean by static? What is a logical challenge? What are players solving? And what do I mean by the assistance of clues? Well, let's break this down. First off, static. What I mean by this is the puzzle doesn't do anything until the players force it to. So to put it in a trite philosophical term, if the tree falls in a forest and no one's around, it didn't fall in the forest, all right? It's just because no one was there to see it. And that's what we need with the players. We need the player there to enact and participate in what's happening in that current setup. And that setup happens before the players even enter the room. 
And in an escape game, it's pretty obvious. You set the room up before they're there. They go in, they tear the room to shreds, they rip stuff off the walls, they have tons of fun, but it's all static until they're in the room. It can also include dynamic information. So things can change. The static element is that it comes a priori to the player experience. Once you have all that created, then you start having this dynamic stuff being generated. So No Man's Sky, <coughs> Minecraft, all those games also fit this definition of static because their algorithm is created before the players even play the game. It's being decided upon by a designer. That's the game designer. A logical challenge. Well, logic is self-referential in a game. It needs to know what it is in reference to what is around it. And so you don't want to have a Mad Hatter experience where the rules of the Tea Party constantly change at the whim of whoever is wherever. That's really, really, really hard for players to follow. So what you want to do is make it so the logic is coherent, at least inside of the room. So if you want to say the color purple always means that you need to find a key, sure, why not? If you want to make it that every triangle unlocks a box, that's great. But that logic needs to be consistent. And logic and rules go hand in hand. But the logic, despite the, my Tea Party analogy earlier, you can still change it. You can still alter what the players think about the world around them. So midway through the game, you could change that triangle from opening up a box to playing audio. And now all triangles play audio. As long as the players are aware of this, they're okay to go forward with it. Because what the players ultimately need to do, what I mean by players solve, is if your puzzle, it, it, ha it has to, your puzzle has to be solvable. If it isn't, you're just being a jerk. And you're just being like, hey guys, welcome to my room, haha, <laughs> can't get out, you suck. That's just mean. And being, like, we, there's enough mean people in the world, we don't need more of them. So you want your puzzles to be solvable, otherwise it just come across as frustration. And if it's not solvable, then it's not a puzzle. And I really want to highlight this because a lot of early game design, game designers and a lot of early escape games sort of stood at this as a point of pride. We made our puzzles so hard that nobody can achieve them. It's like, okay, so then why am I showing up just to fail? Like, that was school for me. But, you know. The thing that makes it different, though, is how do you solve these puzzles? And that's where the fun comes in. That's where the joy, those little moments of I did this, we did this, it's all there. That's where that, that all comes in. And how do we get them there? Through the assistance of clues. So I want you to think abstractly about this. Because the clues, they need to be in the room, contained to the room. If we start referencing stuff outside the room, we have that context problem. We have the inability of players to understand what's going into this room. So the, all the answers need to be inside that room. The same way that every game has all the answers inside of the game. And if it's not inside of that game experience, then you're just being a jerk. We don't need that. Okay, so all of this. Puzzles can be anything you want them to be. They just need to make sense, they need to be logical, and they need to be coherent to the player, and the player needs the information present to be able to achieve them. And this brings us to what happens if we put all the puzzles in order. We create a flow. And the concept of flow, who, who actually is familiar with flow? Who's heard this before as a design? Okay, so some of you. Great. Flow is how you feel. <laughs> it's all about your emotional state. And the concept of flow in a game basically can boil down to this wonderful graph. And what you'll see here is this is horrible, horrible flow. We have uh, states of frustration and boredom at either extreme. So flow is that middle band where you sort of feel good about yourself. And if over the time of the game, things get too easy, players will get too bored. And if things are too hard, they get too frustrated and they spiral out of that flow. So you want to keep them in that state of flow as long as possible. And that means that they get the ability to get those moments of like, oh yeah, this is easy, I'm so good. And then they come across a really hard puzzle and they're like, uh, what do I do here? And they get really scared. That's actually kind of great because now you're the emotional state of the player is going up and down and the emotional states start changing, they start to feel, you know, really good. Like time is on their side and they're having a good, good experience. So you want to avoid things that are too hard, too early in the game. And you want to avoid things that are too easy, too late in the game because we want to keep them in this trajectory of flow. So this is a straight line on this diagram. You're never going to get a straight line. It's always going to fluctuate, just like a good story. So there's also ways we could think about flow. 
we can have linear, multilinear, and open. Linear is the most obvious. You do puzzle one, leads to puzzle two, leads to puzzle three, leads to puzzle four, then you get out. That works really well for small group games, so for small teams, I should say. Uh, but when you start getting bigger groups, you don't want seven people all around one puzzle at, at every single step of the, of the experience. That's a little overwhelming for people. So you want to have either multilinear or open. The difference between multilinear and open, despite the fact that they start the same with multiple entry points, the key difference is multilinear has these moments where things sort of, if you will, for lack of a better description, bottleneck. And then everyone's working on the same puzzle at the same time, but the way they got there is different. Whereas open basically means that, hey, you need to have three things or two things or five things. Once you have all five things, then the, you've won the game. Multilinear, you get four things that leads to the one, and that one thing will get you out. So there's sort of a way of thinking about your designs. And the way we modify this could impact flow. So you want to always have that idea of flow. Because this is another way we can learn from video games. Is in video games, flow is essential. This is why you inadvertently buy $15,000 worth of Pokemon Go stuff, or you, you farmed all the vills, whatever you've done. It's because these game designers have figured out the flow that keeps you engaged, keeps you wanting to play, and keep progressing. They figured it out, and there's no reason why we can't apply that same stuff to things like escape games. So let's take a look at other things we could learn from escape or from video games. Um, one is uh, <laughs> free to play. I said this to a room full of escape game owners, and they all were like, free to play? What does that mean? Oh, I can't give my game for free. What's going on? And anyways, I don't want to go in down that path so f too much, but I do think that there's much like we saw on the App Store, where early people made lots of easy money, and then at the end, it was really hard to make a lot of money. At the end, it's, not, it's still going on. People are still making money in the app store. But uh, we've seen this switch to free-to-play. And the way the escape game industry is developing, I'm, I'm just waiting for the moment when we get free-to-play escape games. It's inevitable. In fact, I've been working on, on one. So, video games. Let's use the flow. So how I want to get you guys thinking about flow in escape games or other experiences that are similar to escape games is I have a sort of approach that I use. This is what I do. It doesn't necessarily mean it's what will work for you. But what I think about is each puzzle has an input. And those puzzle inputs can be very, very, very open. So an input to a puzzle could be very literal. It could be a key. And then you figure out where that key goes. Your input can also be an abstract idea or concept. It could also be a narrative point. Same with output. Output could be any of that. Output can also be the input to another puzzle. So you start to track and stack things in order. All of these puzzles, over time, develop a relationship. That relationship creates the flow of the game. So if you have a series of super hard puzzles in a row, that's going to make players frustrated because they're going from hard to hard to hard to hard to hard to hard. That's not a good flow. So you're going to want to think about how do we change the input or how do we change the output of these puzzles to make them easier. So here's a, a trite little example I have. And in it, it, it's just basically going through these progressions of how to go through the puzzles. The description is actually what you do inside of the puzzle. And that description, then, is one way of sort of thinking about this. So let's say people love the lockbox. They're like, this lockbox is great. It's so good. I love that puzzle. Then other people are like, well, that cup filler is so right. Like, it just feels good to do. But what about this flag book? This feels so out of place. Then I, after play testing, will be like, all right, well, we know the output of the lockbox. Maybe it has to be the flag book because other puzzles might revolve on the flag book. And maybe the lockbox could only fit the flag book. So like, all right, we're stuck with that output. So now we need to figure out how do we change that input slash the, uh, the description of the flag book. Well, then all you need to do is modify how you get that flag book applied inside of the description. But the output should still be the same. At the end of the flag book puzzle, they should still get access to the vault and whatever else there is there. 
So this is how I apply my video game thinking to escape games, the relationship of puzzles to one another and the concept of how puzzles work inside themselves. Some other examples we can use from video games. One, have a tutorial level. Tutorial levels, if you ever played a game, you know them well. They basically get you into the game, teach you the mechanics, teach you the rules, teach you the logic. And it's really simple to, to sort of lay out at the beginning of the game. You give people simple puzzles. In fact, I'm actually a big fan of giving players easy wins at the start of an escape game just to make them feel good. And then you give them a hard puzzle and they feel really bad. <laughs> but you want to give that sort of that change. And so with this, the uh, tutorial level, you want to train players. So if you want to have that triangle being uh, a representation of getting into a locked box, this is the moment to do it. If you want to have color association, this is where you want to do it. You want to establish how everything is connected in a logical way for the players. And this is a really, really good thing to do if you are at a tourist destination or you're using escape games for corporate training. Because in both of those settings, you tend to get people who have never played an escape game before and they don't know what to look for, so you have to train them what to look for. And as a result, you want to have much more of an ease into the game before just like sending them with all these problems. Similarly, we want to use level design. So level design in video games is, is super important because it, it again, is the flow of the level. It's all that fun stuff. And if we have difficulty with that, if we think about the level as the order of puzzles, then we have level design. Because now we can think of things that players have in a video game, like their starting position. In a video game, we could change whatever we want. We want the player to start on the ceiling. Why not? We want the player to figure out that they're no longer human. Now they're, I don't know, a shark. Cool. Why not? We could do that. We could change all of these things in a video game. In an escape game, we can't change all of those elements. What we can do is think about their emotional state. Are they happy, scared, sad, investigate? Like, what is their mo what is their mood at that moment? And what do they have in their inventory? And inventory here could be, conceived, uh, could be uh, conceptualized as knowledge or as actual items inside of their room that they have. And this is stuff we want to use for, for thinking about the games because now we know what the players know and we can sort of think about what they're going for. Another thing about level design is usually the end goal is very, very clear. Get to point B, protect, you know, do an escort mission, uh, solve this riddle, beat this particular puzzle. It's all very obvious in the end goal. And a lot of escape games, they don't do this. They're just like, yeah, figure it out. It's like, well, what are the players, they need to know what to figure out before they could figure it out. Because if you, you, you don't know what you don't know. And that's what we need to get the players. We want to have the players know what they're trying to do. Because if the players aren't seeing what you want them to see, then we could use what, you know, we sort of guide the players using these techniques. We could change the lighting in a room. We could change the audio. We could also, again, color code things. We could contrast stuff so it looks like it's out of place. We could use a lot of different hints in terms of our layout of the room to draw players' attention to particular places. For example, all humans are idiots. We're really dumb, and it's kind of wonderful. Because if we're, if we're given a dark space in a big room, and there's one light in that room, oh, we're like moths. We go right to that light. That's true in real life, and that's true in video games, and in an escape game, you could do that as well. You want players to go someplace? Just put a light on it and darken the rest, and they'll go there. It happens all the time. It's, it's kind of like, I don't know, I feel like we get predictable after a while. Okay, so here's an example. Where do you start in a room like this? We see a lot going on here. We could either start our investigation in the table in the middle, what's in that little glass thing there. We can rip off the dust covers of the furniture. We can start looking at the paintings. There's a lot to do here. And if you're doing a small team game, this might be too much. And there's some players who, when it's a first experience, might just go in here and say, well, I don't want to disturb anything because it all might have some, some important symbolism somewhere. And they're not going to start moving stuff around. Experienced players are going to go into this room and basically just tear everything up. You see there's a rug there? They're going to move the furniture, rip up the rug, and probably take a pickaxe to the floor just to make sure they didn't miss anything. And so you, this is stuff you got to think about. 
So this might be too much in that context. But we take a look at this. This is nice and concise. We can tell that we have a lot of, we have a lot of information here being conveyed in a very simple way. There could be a bird-based puzzle. We also have a very good clear, clear key here, and that little P has a keyhole inside of it. So now we know that perhaps if we find one bird and we then take it to the other bird, we might unlock something, or we get the key, we look for a P in the room, and that's where we put the key and we unlock something. So this is a very, very uh, obvious sort of challenge setup. Another element we can use from video games is this idea of vista moments. And this is when we give the player the ability to sit back and relax and think, I'm so great. We did this. We're the best escape people ever. And that's really what we're trying to get them to enjoy. Because it's a moment for them to, after they have that moment of frustration, to really embrace the fact that they're succeeding and really, really love it. And in video games, we see this after boss battles. We see this after big moments, big reveals. Those of you who played Last of Us, uh, one of the greatest Vista moments in that game it involves giraffes. And for the rest of you, you'll be confused why giraffes matter. But they're basically big rewards for the player off of something they've accomplished. Another thing we could learn from video games, which we can actually take from the world of writing, it's not unique to games at all, is in fact that writing games took this from the world of, of literature, is a three act story structure, or six, nine, whatever you want. And basically, what you want to do is have a clear call to action, have your players deal with whatever that is and then have a big intense moment to find out whether or not they are victorious or they failed at whatever their mission goal happened to be. But the key thing here is that you know where they're going to go. And that's really, really important. And it's a structure, because it's so familiar to us, players can follow that simple storyline. Three acts, you know? Figure out what to do, do it, figure out if you succeeded. Very simple. I've played some escape games where it's so convoluted that at the end of it, we thought we averted like thermonuclear war or, or something, and, and, but really all we were doing was like getting into a vault. And we were all like really, because there were so many plot twists and so many different problems that we ran into. So how do we improve puzzles? Well, first of all, I always want to say there's room to improve. <laughs> Every puzzle could be a better puzzle. Every experience could be a little bit better. So a big thing we want to think about is when to stop improving. And usually that's when you run out of time or money. Anyways, uh, you can use what we just went through, thinking about video games. But we could also think about reframing the perspective of our players. And that is going to like more of that story twist, more clear in terms of what we want to do, make it very, very obvious. Uh, there's a bunch of common problems, uh, some which I'll come to a bit later, like bottlenecking, people getting confused, not knowing what to look at. Uh, there's also issues in terms of what do players touch versus not touch in a room. For that room I showed you guys earlier with the paintings on the wall, are the paintings removable? If so, what does that mean? Can they smash the paintings? Players will destroy anything they get their hands on. And it's something every escape game owner knows is that they have to not only have a backup, they need to have a backup for their backup, and just in case that fails, have another backup. And that's sort of what they need to do because players are very um, greedy in knowledge and they're always trying to get more, which is great. That's what we want them there. So as with most things, another way to improve is go do something else. Like, I don't know, travel, uh, read a book. There's a lot of things you can do. There's a great event happens around the world called Puzzled Pint. And it's doing logic puzzles with beer. It's kind of fun You go with a group. It's uh, puzzlepint.com. Check it out. That's a Puzzle Pint puzzle. And there is, that's really hard to say, uh, Puzzle Pint puzzle uh, that could actually be an escape game puzzle. If you blow that up and make that, that sort of, they're interweaving some text into paper, imagine that, but with sheets of fabric and you're weaving it through an actual wooden structure. That would be a really sort of neat exercise inside of an escape game. So there's a lot of inspiration you could get from these pure logic paper based games. I would also suggest going to theater and doing anything. Uh, I love that smoking but it's so ridiculous. This, actually, this photo, uh, I took this because I, I was uh, actually in Guatemala and at Christmas time, that's why this is there, and I saw that they were using CDs as a way to like illuminate and make it look really neat. And I was like, 
maybe not the most religious thing I've done in my life. I thought, oh, that's a great game. Because imagine if you have this setup, and then we have a CD player somewhere in the room, and now the players need to figure out what CD to put in the CD player to get the clue at the, at the appropriate time stamp. And we could disassemble, like maybe it's very, I don't know, heathenistic of me, disassemble <laughs> this religious icon, and then all of a sudden we have a neat puzzle. But of course, you know, get rid of the re change of context, and then you're not real, no longer religious. But that's something we can do uh, and get a lot of motivation from. Another thing we got to really remember here is players are easily distracted, super easy. And so we want to keep that game flow focused for them because we want to have it so they really, really understand what's happening and the order things are going on. So for example, we got that story note. We want to make it so they understand all the key story beats so they know what their goals are. Uh, another way of thinking about puzzles is, very quickly is uh, thinking about the short-term, medium goal, and long goal, uh, long-term goal of all of their activities. So long-term goal might be getting out of the room. Short-term goal would be finding all, all the little cats in the room. And then the medium-term goal would be get, using something with those cats. So then we have all these different where puzzles overlap because having puzzles overlap is really great in a lot of contexts, but sometimes they might overlap too much and players might not know where to put their attention. And they'll get really confuddled and all sorts of problems and they won't be able to understand the clues you've given for them to figure out what to do from a moment to next. Another thing you can always do is just reorder the puzzles. So if you find out people are getting stuck on particular beats, change those beats, just modify them. And it'll work really, really well. And this is something we really want to think about in terms of uh, distraction as well as like too much stimulus. So if we're giving the players too many puzzles at the start, that might be a problem because they don't actually, they'll suffer from design or design, uh, decision paralysis. And they just don't know where to begin and what goes with what. And so one of the problems with the open based puzzles is exactly that. So you want to think about what your target audience is, how and what they deal with information in particular ways, and let that flow from there. You also want to be able to make connections between these. So some puzzles will have inherent connections, but you will also need to make the connections themselves. So you want to provide constant context for what the players are doing. You want to provide feedback. If the feedback isn't present, isn't obvious, then players will get confused. One room I'm designing, uh, well designed recently, uh, we have a player press a, press a button on one wall and behind them a door opens. But, we, but I always say have two modes of feedback. Pressing the button doesn't let you know the door open behind you. So in order to let them know the door open behind them is by putting chimes on the door. So you press the button and behind you, you hear chimes. Now everyone in the room is going to be like, what was that sound? And look at the door, see it opens. The player now understands pressing that button opens the door and they make that connection. Big issue with escape games is bottlenecking. Um, this is when you have a bunch of puzzles and then one puzzle sort of is everyone's stuck on that and you can have a team of 11, 12, how many people all focused on one thing. That can work but it could also be very problematic. One way to do that is have other puzzles in the room that players can work on. Sometimes rooms have supplemental puzzles that allow you to understand more of the story world. You can actually just reduce player size. Every escape game room owner hates that because if you reduce player size you're reducing their profit. So that's not usually a solution they like. But you could also change it up with more obvious tasks. And if you use red herrings, please, please, please be careful. Everything in the room is a red herring if it's not part of a puzzle. So by adding a single red herring, you might be like quadrupling the difficulty for players. So you want to be very, very careful when you use those. One thing I keep saying is players don't understand the goal a lot of the time. You want to make it very clear with a call to action. Uh, remind them what they're doing throughout. And every puzzle should support your narrative. I will say this now, I keep saying it uh, to my students, but in a game, mechanics are the message. The player needs to be doing the action you want them to be learning from. In the in world of film and TV, it's show it, don't say it. In games, it's experience, don't show it. You want the players to have it. La you know what? Don't think you're smart. This is key. Every designer thinks they're smarter than the people who are playing their games. They're wrong. Uh, players are really, really good at this. And uh, um, 
problems with a lot of these designers that think they're really smart and they're outwitting the players is, is they don't think about the fact that the players don't know what they know. And I've actually talked to escape game designers who are frustrated that players don't understand that clearly that reference is to Star Trek episode season eight, three, four, where Picard is inside of the Borg ship. And yeah, obviously the solution is press B-O-R-G. And it's like, how would anyone know this? But they get so frustrated because like, oh, it's so obvious. Everyone's seen Star Trek. It's like, no. And this is a big, big problem. Even if you're using existing story worlds. If you're making a Star Wars escape game, don't use obscure Star Wars knowledge. Just be like, there's a Death Star. Good, the end. Like, that's every Star Wars, it seems, nowadays. But, like, that's all you need. Okay, and also, please, prototype, play, test, repeat. That is also key. Prototype it. Figure out what's going on, catch early mistakes, play test it, catch more mistakes, play test it again, catch more mistakes, play test it again, ruin your confidence, play test it again, rebuild your confidence, and just keep doing it. So we talked about puzzles and what they are and how they all work to form like a system which forms flow. And with all that flow, we're able to better understand what our players understand so we could help them move through. There's a lot of stuff we could learn from video games is always think about better puzzle design. And a lot of aspects of better puzzle design is just thinking about how the puzzles relate to each other and how your players relate to the knowledge you're giving them inside of their puzzle room experience. You were here. Aww. Aww. Yeah.